Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jan Nuviskovic. I've worked in cybersecurity for the past 17 odd years from various different angles. I began prosecuting cybercrime. Uh, then I transitioned to advising organizations on how to comply with various regulations and industry standards. And now I help organizations manage their human risk or the human factors we've heard today. Now, during the pandemic, I had a burnout and uh, it was rather severe. And at, at some stage, I eventually went uh, to hospital to a specialized burnout treatment program. And when I was in hospital, I was absolutely shocked by the number of information security professionals that kept coming into this burnout program. Now, keep in mind, this was during the pandemic. And there were more information security professionals in the burnout program than there were frontline healthcare workers. So I got really curious and I wanted to look into this more. I thought, this is crazy. What is going on here? As I looked into it, what I discovered really shocked me. So last year, um, Vectra AI put out um, a research study. They found that 50% of your UK cyber chiefs are feeling burnt out because of the immense pressure you're under. And earlier this year, Gartner um, released some findings um, and predicted that by 2025, a quarter of all cybersecurity leaders will change their roles entirely due to workplace stress and burnout. Now, this is a massive problem, not only because we face a huge global shortage in cyber talent, but also because if half of you are burning out, more than half according to some studies, how are we managing our increasingly sophisticated cybercrime threat? We're losing huge amounts of institutional knowledge and of course, beyond that, at an individual level, it has a huge toll, takes a huge toll. And burnout culture is also a massive problem for organizations because it costs so much in terms of turnover and productivity costs. So on average, globally, organizations are spending 300, over $300 billion a year as a result of burnout. And that's twice as much as what they're spending on average on cybersecurity. Who here is a CISO? Can you raise your hand if you're a Chief Information Security Officer? Okay, not so many. Anyone here working in a cybersecurity team? Okay, so this applies to all of you as well. So ask yourselves, if burnout was affecting you or your team, how well would you be able to manage a cyber crisis? And what if that cyber crisis was to last for, say, six weeks? Because that's a bare minimum. Recruitment during this time of a global shortage in cyber talent is hard enough. It's not something you want to be doing during the middle of a cyber incident. You want to be making sure that you and your team are performing at optimal levels before a crisis and then during one as well. So let me ask you, anybody here got a business continuity plan in place in your organizations? Fantastic. And you will all know, therefore, that those business continuity plans, which get activated when, for example, you have a cyber crisis, they involve all parts of the business, right? It's not something that just the security professionals can respond to. And so recognizing that cybersecurity throws up a lot of multidisciplinary, challenging, dynamic problems for us, we recognize that the solutions must, must be equally as nuanced. And we need to be having conversations that are also interdisciplinary. And so for that reason, um, in terms of raising awareness about burnout, I don't have all the answers. And so it's with great pleasure that I'm joined by other experts in their fields in mental health and organizational psychology. And the idea today is that we're gonna take you on a bit of a sprint, a Marcus Rashford style sprint, <laughs> through the challenges for cybersecurity professionals in terms of burnout. 
And because there's a tendency to talk about this in a, in a very negative way, of course it has a lot of negative implications, we really want to leave you with some key solutions, some practical takeaways for you to implement in your personal lives and in your organisations and your teams so that we can try and also show you that burnout is not inevitable. And so with that, Beck. Hi, my name's Beck McEwen. I've been working as an occupational psychologist for 20 years now. Um, the last percentage of my time in that workplace was in academ academia, where I did research into human behaviour in the workplace, and I specialised in aviation and also the defence industries. And what I learned in those, those 15 years, I've now been bringing to cyber security, and that's kind of why I'm here today, because I see an awful lot of overlap in the research that's been done in academia that could be useful to cybersecurity sector in solving some of the people issues that you have. Um, and I'm hoping that that will become more apparent as we go through this session. Good afternoon, my name's Eve Palmiter. I'm a clinical traumatologist, therapist, and consultant. I focus on power, potential, and performance, and the stuff that gets in the way, like the misuse and abuse of power, and the wear and tear of what we choose to do, which includes workplace burnout. Shall I start us off with a simple structure? Please. Okay, so the World Health Organization defines burnout as resulting from chronic workplace stress that's not been successfully managed. Now to make that definition more useful to us, we're gonna split the word stress to show cause and effect, right? The stressors and the stress effects. I shall work backwards from the stress effects. These are that we feel increasingly exhausted, cynical, and ineffective. And what that sounds like coming from a human is, I don't have the energy, I don't have the skills, and even if I did, what's the point? I don't think I can do this anymore. And I'm sure that there are some other people in this room who've experienced that. I have. Ah, we're all in good company. Very good. Now. This is particularly problematic for trying to engage well with an effective security culture. So drawing on what you've said, if we think about the broader team of staff who you're training, if they're experiencing burnout, they are going to be less likely to be able to engage, retain, and do justice to your training. They are going to be more likely to be prone to errors, less likely to notice errors or indicators of a phishing email, less likely to report errors as trust is low, and more likely to take shortcuts as energy is low. So for these reasons and a variety of others, I would like to invite us to consider what if the causes of burnout were part of the threat landscape? And what if the effects of burnout were like malware and tear due to the disruption to the functioning of our systems. Reasonable? Very reasonable. Thank you. I think especially when you consider that 74 to 80% of all uh, successful cyber incidents are the result um, of human error. And we know that stress really impacts how we behave. Um, and research from Stanford um, University shows that understanding how stress impacts our behavior is actually critical to understanding cybersecurity threat um, and, and cybersecurity risk. And just to give one quick anecdote, um, I was talking to someone the other day from a, a very large um, tech credit card company who was talking about the real life consequences of burnout on his cybersecurity team. And actually not on his team, but on, on a team from another company that he was dealing with. And they reported that they had a CISO who was very burnt out and during an incident, the CISO, you spoke, Eve, about lack of engagement and lack of um, being able to, to perform at your highest level. The CISO was so burnt out that he wasn't able to feed his team critical information that was necessary to manage a cyber incident. And the company was suffering tremendously, not just because of the incident, but also because of the way in which it was being managed, which was suboptimal because of the state of the, of the team that was in charge of managing that incident. Right. So that's the landscape. Shall we look at the causes? If you would, please. To our, we have a beautiful slide here, and this slide is an invitation 
for you because we're here talking about principles and practices. Those blank spaces are there for you to personalize with any of your insights from your own workplace. Now, these are vectors, these six elements, and also levers, so we can make them better or worse. They are in a list, but they are uh, all interconnected. So I'll give an indicative question for each, and you see what resonates. Workload. How well matched are you with the volume, variety, and type of work you do? Choice and control. How much influence do you have over how, when, and where you do your work and the resources you can allocate to it? Rewards and recognition. How much acknowledgement do you get for the value you bring? The attacks you prevent? Social connection in the workplace. How's the camaraderie? If that's a bit too high, how's the civility? Fairness. How is the transparency, the accountability? How is the justice? How protected are you when things go wrong? And values. Is what's important to you and what's important to your organization well aligned in practice? Any mismatches here are going to contribute to experiencing burnout. Beck, could you talk to us about what looks good at team level? At team level, really, for me, I'm looking at the social connection and fairness and values because I think those are the ones that come into play with a team. Um, teams are important. Social connection is important. When I say that, it means like feeling part of a team, feeling that you belong, gives you confidence, helps build resilience. The opposite happens if you're a part of a team that has toxic behaviours and you don't particularly feel welcome or listened to in that team. And what we actually try to build is psychological safety. Now, those, that's a phrase I've seen bandied around on LinkedIn quite often over the past couple of years. So what actually is it? Psychological safety is for someone to feel that they can actually join a conversation without being criticised, without being ridiculed, to be listened to and to not have to be in any fear of criticism or consequences or even losing their job for speaking out. What happens with that is what you get is diversity of thought. And when I say diversity, I do not mean protected characteristics. I mean listening to everybody in the team. We've all been in a situation, and I know I have, where you have a team at work and somebody says something and the rest of the group roll their eyes. As an ex-lecturer, I used to see it in classrooms all the time. We're rolling our eyes because we don't necessarily understand the way that person thinks or we don't understand that why on earth they think the way they do, why they um, believe in those things. It kind of doesn't matter, but what does matter is the fact that they have every right to believe those things as much as you do. And if you take that little step back and take a breath in between the eye roll and the tut, <laughs> it, it creates that space to actually think, what is this person saying? So that itself creates uh, an environment of psychological safety. I see some links between this and also the DevSecOps um, stuff that I've seen talked about and I've read articles on. And it's about the underlying principles of that. It's about uniting people and it's about taking collaborative responsibility. And that kind of brings me on to the next point about fairness, really, because psychological safety is an outcome of a thing called just culture. And this is something I learned a lot about when I was doing research in the aviation sector. And in fact, aviation regulators actually promote just culture to organizations to build it. So what is a just culture? It's what we call a fair and equitable culture. So rather than pointing the finger and blaming people for mistakes, it's about promoting curiosity around mistakes. What happened? Why did that mistake happen? Because you can almost guarantee that it's never one single point of failure. There will be a series of events that led up to that. If you'd like to know more about that, I urge you to go and Google Reasons Cheese Model. Um, it's absolutely marvellous. It's designed for aviation, but if you look at that, you can definitely map that onto cybersecurity, because even if you have a human as a point of failure, there will be a set of events that lead up to that. The idea of a just culture is to promote continual learning. Um, so whenever a mistake is identified, you find out why it happened, you can go and put it right. Now, 
that only occurs if you've got psychological safety. Who is going to put their hand up and say, hey, I made a terrible mistake, if they think they're going to get fired for it? So it's about, I think, aviation actually have um, reporting mechanisms whereby actually you're encouraged to share when you make a mistake, regardless of the consequences of that, because the important thing is that we learn from that mistake, not that we punish you for it, which I think is quite an, um, an interesting way of looking at things. And largely, it's been very successful in aviation. Um, if people are working in this sort of environment, they build their confidence. And as um, Jonathan from SOFOS said this morning about empowerment, if people are empowered, they are more likely to, to work well and to carry on with the processes that you're trying to, um, to put into the workplace. It's not just about the way that people behave, though. For a just culture to be embedded successfully into a workplace, there has to be some policies and procedures in place to support that more formally, which I think is something you probably can talk about. Yeah, now. thanks, Beck. Um, indeed, and just to tap onto something you said uh, about, you know, feeling safe and psychologically safe, the importance of being able to put up your hand and acknowledge that you've made an error. I mean, we see this a lot in phishing campaigns, right? So, can you just give me a show of hands? How many of you have um, phishing simulations in your organisation that? will result in someone being punished, say by HR, if they accidentally click on a phishing link, say multiple times. Anyone punish their employees? Right. So it's great to see that the number of hands in the conferences I attend is going down over time. But as you can see, there are still some that do it. And, and the research shows that this is one of the, the best ways to destroy trust in your security teams. Um, and one of the best ways to, to erode any psychological safety. We're, we're all human, so we all, I think most of us are, <laughs> so we all make mistakes, right? And part of making a mistake is the opportunity to learn from that and to reiterate. We see this both playing out in how our security cultures evolve and also in terms of the strain that's placed on security professionals and how that contributes to an environment that either contributes to a burnout culture or mitigates it. So on an organizational level, uh, there are a couple of things that you can do within your organizations. So the first thing I would say is pay attention to the behaviors that you're encouraging within your team. Look at the behaviors that your leadership is, is modeling. Um, are they modeling the idea that it is normal and human to make a mistake and we want people to own up to it? Or are they encouraging people to not put up their hand and, and not to own their vulnerability. It takes 294 days on average, I think, for a, for a data breach to be discovered and acted upon within an organization. And I really wonder how much we could reduce that number if we actually increased psychological safety in our organizations and people were like, hey, security team, I need to tell you immediately, I think I've accidentally clicked on a phishing link. The word culture comes from the Latin, cultura, and it means to cultivate, to grow, to tend. And I wonder how many leaders in your organizations are really focused on really growing people in your organization, growing that healthy dyna dynamic that makes people feel like they're welcome and you share risk amongst each other. So also keep in mind that as we heard from Ewan McGrath from ThreatLocker earlier this morning, even the best tech is not enough if you aren't paying attention to the human factor. So in 2018, Gallup found in a research study that workload, whilst important, was not as important as the rewards and recognition. If you have bad management, this is a massive contributor to employee burnout. So think about it in your teams. If there's any bullying or harassment that's ongoing, make sure to root that out ASAP. Because if you don't, it sends a message to your other team members. I don't really care about you. I care that I get the results, but I don't really care about how you achieve them and how, what happens to you as a result. From the board and the C-suite, um, anyone here on the C-suite? Great. You have an immense opportunity to set the tone from the top and to lead by example. Make sure that you are encouraging relationships with your cybersecurity leaders. 
The World Economic Forum in its global security outlook of 2023 recommends that you meet with your cybersecurity leaders, your CISOs, at least once per month. The organisations that have a close relationship between their cybersecurity leaders, the C-suite and the board experience greater cyber resilience. And if you don't have cyber expertise on your board, consider looking to, um, for, to, looking to upskill your board members or looking for external support in the form of board advisory services. And I'm happy to talk to you about that. We do offer that um, as well. But I'm not up here to sell. I'm up here to help you. So if you're, a, if you're a chief information security officer, we have a couple in the audience, or maybe you're a cybersecurity leader in your security team, consider outsourcing your problem as much as possible. Right, so automate whatever you can. Look to third, third party managed security services to, do, to reduce the amount of manual labor and workload on your teams. At the process level, look for any friction that's unnecessary. Can you reduce some online, uh, can, can you reduce some friction by looking for single sign-on? Can you reduce friction and increase security by looking at zero trust measures? And also build close relationships with HR and compliance. Try and remove those punitive measures that tell people that it's not safe for them to make an innocent mistake. Make sure that when people are doing their security awareness trainings, they're not being punished, but they're feeling empowered to learn, to educate, and to get better, because this can also help them in their personal lives. And just as a side note, one of the most powerful things I've seen done in a security awareness training program is holding um, talks on sessions for employees that help them, for example, combat cyberbullying for their children. When people start to learn how this impacts them on a personal level, they then bring that back to work rather than the other way around, which is a lot less likely. And on the people side, if you're not taking your annual leave, if you're not taking regular breaks throughout the day, I encourage you to do so, to lead by example and encourage the people on your team to do so too. We're humans, we're not machines and we need to take breaks. And you might think, well, I don't have capacity in my team to do that. Set up a backup system. A friend of mine at Google, they have a two-layered backup system. So if one person is on call, they've also got someone else on call. Right, so you go on holidays, you know that you can delegate to another cybersecurity leader, and if something goes down with that person, they've got another backup. So having that three-tiered system is a great way to ensure that you get to take a break, and so do your team members, and it sets a great example. At the individual level, I think, Beck, you might have mentioned this, be humble, admit your mistakes. It shows a shared commitment to vulnerability. And reinforce to your stakeholders that Investing in technology is important, but it's not a panacea. Threat actors today are exploiting technical vulnerabilities, and they're doing so by preying on human vulnerabilities. So putting us, people, humans at the center, is a great way to make sure that we all benefit. And I'm a firm believer that if we tackle uh, this problem in cybersecurity, where we tend to focus on technology and ignore the human factor, I'm convinced that that's also going to result in a positive uptick for the pressures on CISOs as well. At the end of the day, we have a lot of emphasis on the technology in cyber. But ask yourselves, what about the human operating system? Right. Anything from either of you to no. add up? Um, Given that we can't solve systemic problems at the individual level, um, there are a couple of things that people could consider doing. So number one, professional satisfaction butters us against cynicism and stress. So we can deliberately notice the effects we have, why it matters, and we can deliberately, no <laughs> deliberately notice the effects that other people have and why it matters. And we can tell them in real time positive feedback is very effective rather than waiting for the annual review. Secondly, build more skills. I don't need to tell you that. But if we continue to work at the very edge of our skill set or work out of our scope of practice without the appropriate support, that can be very, very wearing and add to this feeling of being ineffective. So whether that's more formal training or whether that's a special interest project which you can get dedicated time to, do that. Thirdly and finally from me, I'm going to imagine that you are all early adopters. 
and I shall say that we are with this now as we were with health and safety in the workplace 50 years ago. And we know that small, local focused efforts towards best practice can transform industries. So what you can do now can make a huge difference over time. Anything else? No pressure then. <laughs> <laughs> I think finally, I mean, after echoing everything that you would say, I think it's, I hear a lot of focus on technology. I hear a lot of focus on human um, processes, not so much on the human being. Yeah. Those three things together are your capability. If your people are not resilient, your process, your systems, and your capability is not resilient, keep an eye on those as much as you keep an eye on your tech stack. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Eve, Bex, thank you very much indeed for a very fascinating topic. It's another human aspect of cyber, and cyber is not all techie. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.